As we are in 1 Timothy, we're going to be in chapter 4 today, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a warning. Here in December, which is next Sunday, is the first Sunday of December, which is just hard to believe. I can't believe next Sunday is December already, but it is. We're going to take a break, and we're going to do a Christmas series We've got a five-part Christmas series ending on Christmas Eve. We will, again, have a Christmas Eve service, okay? So we want you to come, Christmas Eve, 5.30. We're going to have a service, but we're going to take five lessons, basically, out of the Christmas story. We're going to talk about them. Some of these are going to be like, well, I'm familiar with that already. And you very, may well be, but hopefully there, there's going to be some new things in there that maybe you'll think about, some things that you haven't talked through. So we're going to take a little bit of a break. We're checking on travel plans. It's possible Sammy might be here one of those Sundays, okay? We're kind of leading up to that. So we might have a Sammy Sunday here coming up in just a couple weeks. So a good sermon. Wow. 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 Okay, give me just a minute here. Anybody here ever seen the movie Mr. and Mrs. Smith? All right, okay, there's a scene in there where she throws a knife and stabs her husband in the leg, okay? And she looks at him all apologetic. She's like, like this, and he pulls it out and says, we'll talk later. Kyle, we will talk later, okay? I feel like you have my back with a knife in it, all right? So, yes, it will be a good one, all right. So what we have now coming up is this is going to be a bit of a break for us. This is the last Sunday before we take this, this month of December off. But it's a good one for us to think about because as we enter the holiday season, it's easy to get caught up in life. It's easy to get caught up in the frustrations of shopping, the joys of overeating, and then the frustration of not finding a suit pant suit that you actually want because you sweatpants suit. I see that. I saw that the other day. I didn't know they made them. Sweatpants suits. They need these things for me after Thanksgiving. They're, they look awesome, all right? But we, we're going to get distracted. We're going to get all caught up in stuff in life. Here's the deal. And all of this... We're going to talk about this idea of we've got to focus, guys. We've got to keep our focus on what's happening in life. And Paul in 1 Timothy, here's what he does to us here. It's kind of fun as we're halfway through the book. But in the middle of discussing how a church should function, Paul gives a personal challenge which is the goal of Grace Church. He tells you, look, stay focused, but continue to mature as a follower of Jesus Christ. For us, during this last of November through the month of December, we need to keep our focus. We need to stay focused and we need to continue to mature as followers of Jesus Christ. God has something for us to do during these months. He's got some incredible things for us, but we've got to stay focused. We can't get distracted. We can't walk away from what the message is supposed to be, what our purpose is as a church. He writes in 1 Timothy 3, the purpose of 1 Timothy. He says, I, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is a church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. We understand that 1 Timothy is written so we can know how we should behave as a combined church, but as individuals. Because here's the thing. If we as individuals are doing what we're supposed to be doing, then we as a church be doing what it's supposed to be doing because the church isn't just a building. In fact, it's not a building at all. The church is the people. We are the church. And so we need to know how to behave as a church, as a body. And that's why Paul writes these things to us. And then he says in the first part of chapter four, he says in verse six, he says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. You will be a good, mature follower of Jesus Christ. So then we have to ask, okay, what are these things? What are these things he's talking about? I'm going to do a brief review real quick of some of the things we've covered up to chapter 4. Here's what we've talked about leading up to chapter 4. We've talked about this, that the essence of our message is love. We at Grace, our priority has to be love. We are not here pointing fingers. We're here opening arms. This is what we want. It's all about love. And Paul writes this. He says the aim of our charge is love. It's just from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. It's all about love. This is what our message is. And this comes out of our relationship with God. Because what does Christ do? He comes in. He purifies us, doesn't he? He purifies us. We can have a good conscience standing before him because of what Christ has done for us. And we have that sincere faith knowing that Christ is the only way to heaven. And with all these things that we have, a love is an outpouring of that. The essence of our message is it's all about love. We got to focus on the gospel. In this, we have to focus on the gospel. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get caught up. It's easy to lose what's really important and get caught up in these things. So what's he saying in 1 Timothy 3? 
He says this, great indeed we confess is what? This mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. We're celebrating that this Christmas. Christ coming in the flesh. He was vindicated by the spirit. When he was resurrected from the dead, Romans says, he was vindicated by the spirit through the power of his resurrection, proving he was who he said he was. He was seen by angels. In fact, right now he's in, he's in the presence of angels. He proclaimed among the nations and believed on in the world. That's what's happening even now at this moment. Taken up into glory. And he promises to come again and get us someday soon. This was Christ. And Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says this, For I deliver it to you as of first importance. So guys, this December, this Christmas season, the Thanksgiving season, this is the most important thing for us, is this message. I, just, I just delivered unto you as of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. That is the most important message for us as a church. We've got to keep our focus and recognize this is what he wants from us. He wants us to remember the message. And yet Christmas is very important. I love what somebody told me once, that if it wasn't for the cradle, we wouldn't have the cross. If Christ had never come back as a man, he would never have been able to die on the cross for us. So the Christmas season is every bit as important as what's Easter, what we celebrate at Easter, Christ's resurrection. It's very important. So we got to remember this whole thing that Christ came back and he died for us. And this is the value of what we do. This is, our, this is our message. Last Sunday we talked about how in the middle of all this we can still enjoy life for God's glory. It has to be for God's glory. There are some of us that we want to enjoy life but in such a way that's not glorifying to God. God says, no, do it for my glory. I want you to enjoy life for my glory. Paul writes this, he says, everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, praising God. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. God wants us to enjoy this life, but do it in a way that glorifies him. He says this in 1 Corinthians, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And we talked about that, how God has boundaries, how God talks about different things. He said, yes, this is good, but within my parameters. And we have to do it within his parameters, within his guidelines. That's something for all of us to know. Are we willing to live according to God's guidelines? We talked about you know, eating or drinking. You, you gotta eat, but gluttony is a sin. Sleeping is a valuable thing, okay? I didn't get much sleep last night. I'm dragging today. Sleep is a valuable thing. Too much sleep is laziness, and Proverbs talks about that. We talk about the marriage relationship and all that's with it, and there's a lot of fun there. Within the marriage relationship, the physical union between a man and a woman should be within marriage for God's glory. Outside of that is for your own selfish desires, and it's a sin, it's what the Bible talks about. We mentioned all this last week. So we live according to God's glory. We enjoy life for God's glory. But then we also continue to mature. What's Paul say here? Verse six. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. It's not Timothy. You are right now everything you need to be. Timothy, you've arrived. No, it's not that at all. It's a continuation of doing these things. And you never stop. You always continue on. And then what's Paul say? He says, in the middle of this, I want you to be teachable. Look what he says to Timothy in the last part of that verse. If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. I want to interrupt. Am I talking really fast today? Because I feel like all of a sudden I am. Yes. Perfect for Mark. Mark's ADD. He likes it. Okay. It's good. It's good. That's why I like him on the deacon board. He's my brother from another mother. All right. So if you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Do you catch that part? Being trained, understanding there's value in being taught. There is value in all of us being taught. We have got to be teachable as people. And this is hard because some of us, we grew up in church. You know, we're getting ready to start this Christmas thing and so you're sitting here thinking, all right, here we go. More sermons on Christmas. I hear it every single year. Why do I even go to church? Because it's gonna be the same thing. Well, that's not a teachable spirit. A teachable spirit is someone who comes and say, okay, maybe it's the same story, but maybe it's gonna be a different way or God, maybe I'm gonna learn something from this. Maybe it's something gonna be applied a little bit different. God, teach me something. This whole idea of being teachable. Do we come to church with our arms crossed saying, Pastor, I dare you to teach me something I haven't already heard? Or, Pastor, I'm here. What's God got to say to you today? Can I learn something new today? 
2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. I, I read this verse and I was sitting there and I went over at my sermons and I sat there and I thought about it. God, I think for me personally, every single week, there's a passage I need to learn something new, I need to be teachable on, I need to learn something, I need to be trained in. But I also need to be reproved, I also need correction, I also need training in righteousness, I need to have this attitude, God, where do I need to grow this week? Where do I need to mature? What in my life needs to change? All the scripture is breathed out by God, it's profitable for these things. As a church, we need to be teachable. What that means is we as a congregation need to be teachable. This is the normal word for instruction or teaching intended to form proper patterns of behavior. Why was 1 Timothy written? I write these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. How you might behave is what Paul says. And it talks about this whole idea of teaching, teaching us, it's the idea of knowing how to behave. Are we teachable people? Do we want to know how we should function as a congregation, as a group? We should. Give instruction to a wise man and he will still be wiser. He'll be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. I love this verse because how does it describe this person? One, he's already wise. And two, he's already righteous. And yet he's not done. He's still learning. He wants to know how you can be even wiser. He wants to know how you can be even more righteous. Somebody said that the more you know, the more you learn what you don't know. You just never know, right? It's one of those things. You, you never know what you don't know until you, until you know, right? And, and so you have to learn. You've got to be willing to learn. And so Proverbs talks about the fact you can be a wise man and become wiser. You can be a righteous man and you can still increase in learning. There are some of us here that believe that we are righteous, we may have that attitude, you know, hey, I grew up in church, I'm righteous, but God still has more for us. I've been to school, I've been to seminary, all those things, I'm wise, but God still has more for us. We never stop learning. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction. Whoever heeds reproof is honored. God wants us to be teachable. To be teachable. So when people give us correction, when people come to us and say, you yeah, know, maybe you need adjusting it. Say, Pastor, I don't, I don't need any of that stuff. I'm good. Well, I think I mentioned this in the newsletter. This was kind of weighing on, my, on me this week, is even personally. You know, 1 John 1 eight says, if you are without sin, if a man says he's without sin, then he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. So if I have a sin in my life, which the Bible says I always do, then logically I'm always going to need correction. That's the logical conclusion. If I'm always going to have sin in me that I'm dealing with, I'm always going to need correction. So then how do I deal with that correction when it comes? When it comes from my wife? When it comes from church leaders? When it comes from friends? How do I deal with that correction? How do you deal with that correction when it comes? Do we get angry? Do we get defensive? Do we dismiss it? Do we ignore it? Are we teachable? We need to be teachable. Don't get caught up in silly discussions. This is quite the verse here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. I kind of like this one a lot because it makes, me, it makes me smile just a little bit. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. The New Living Translation says it this way. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. So they think, Pastor, that's not a big deal. We're good here at Grace. And I think to a degree we are. But I'm going to give some examples, all right? We may step on some toes. I stepped on some of mine today. So think about this for just a minute, all right? I don't know how many of you guys remember this. Actually, before I even get into that, Paul repeats this in every book that he wrote to a pastor. He repeats this idea. Second Timothy, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. These things that Paul talks about, you're going to have quarrels, and we shouldn't be quarrelsome. And some of us, we want to be quarrelsome because we want to be right. We want to be right over the craziest stuff. And in reality, who cares? Titus, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. They're unprofitable and worthless. Why does Paul repeat himself so many times? Well, Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because scriptures are God-breathed, 
It's God saying something. And when God repeats himself, we better sit up and listen. God knows when you get a group of people together like this, we end up getting caught up in stuff that doesn't really matter. It doesn't. You guys remember the book, The Da Vinci Code? Anybody remember that book? When that came out, that took the Christian church by storm. All right, we was in Omaha at the time. We had a guest speaker come in. We spent a whole evening talking about the Da Vinci book code, how we can refute it, the whole nine yards. And there's value there. But what happens is it got us so caught up. The Da Vinci code was a fiction book written with the premise that Jesus Christ was married to Mary Magdalene. They had children and their line continues today in a physical essence, okay? And it just took the world by storm, all right? Because this whole theory, it's a fiction book. Okay, now there was a lot of things that happened. They talked about how the Catholic Church was, wanted to squash the rumors and the whole nine yards and everything, okay? But it, it was an interesting read. In fact, I just read it a few weeks ago. It is an interesting read. But it's fiction and it's false, okay? But the church nonetheless got caught up in that for weeks and months. There were books written on the Da Vinci Code. What happened? We got distracted for a little bit. We missed our message. I've got this next one here. This is gonna mean nothing to you guys probably. Very few people have heard of it. It's a board game called the Journeys of Paul board game. This was one that came out back in early 2000, mid 2000, somewhere around in there, mid to late, okay? And so what happened here is that this was patterned after the board game Risk. Some of you were big into Risk, maybe. It's a strategy game where in the Journeys of Paul, you were supposed to come in and you were supposed to evangelize the world better than any of your opponents. Plant the most churches, convert the most of the world. So you had this map on a board game and you were to conquer the world for Jesus. They had weekend-long tournaments for this stuff where Christians would come together and they would play tournaments on this. I'm down in Kansas City. I think it was 2012. I'm down in Kansas City. I'm at an Awana training down there. There's a husband and wife that comes on Friday night. We had the dinner together. And the husband says, I'm not going to be here tomorrow because I'm going to go to this, this tournament all day on Saturday. We're going to play the Journeys of Paul board game. Do you see the irony we're talking, we're playing a game on evangelizing the world, but is anybody actually evangelizing the world? No. And I sat there and I thought, what in the world? And the, okay, so that's Friday night, Saturday, the very next day, we get out there and we're broke up into small groups. They divide us out into teams of six or seven, and we are a lot of commanders, and we're all getting trained, and we're gonna go out and, and do some fun stuff. They say, we want you to go out, I mean, I want you to do something or bring back something that is important to God, that you think is important to God. So my team goes out. We're thinking, what in the world do we do? And we find a 3D puzzle of the world, okay? Think, hey, this is it. God, God died for the world. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. We took that thing back to the restaurant. We put it together. We took it to, a, to show off as this is what God, this is what's important to God. And we were on a roll until the team stood up and said, well, we recognize that souls are important to God. So we evangelized at them all, and we had two people saved this afternoon. And I sat there, and that Hebrew word that we talked about, I felt like this. <laughs> we missed it, didn't we? We missed it. It's not the world as a creation. It's the people on the world that God loved and sent his son for. He didn't send it for this globe we're on. He sent it for people. And that one team got it. And the rest of us learned a lesson. We got caught up. Churches get caught up in chairs versus pews, piano versus recorded music. We sit here at Grace. I, I love the pews. Those things are so comfortable, aren't they? But when we had the pews in here, we had maximum seating of 118. Last Sunday, we had 190 chairs in here, and it didn't feel like it, did it? Everybody come to me, Pastor, where's everybody at? We had so many empty seats. So we took some out this week. Yeah, we did, because we only had 110 people, all right? So you had 80 empty chairs. There's no way we're gonna get this many people at pews. Practically speaking, we're, we're doing what we are because of that. But there's conversations. There are people who say, I'm not gonna have church. If you don't have what I want, we're not coming. These are discussions that we get caught up, we get distracted by. How about sports teams? <laughs> yeah. Now we're stepping on toes, Pastor. Watch it. This weekend is the big weekend, isn't it? Hawkeyes versus Nebraska. Yeah, all right. You know what? I gotta be honest with you. I'm, ex I'm expecting us to lose. It's been, what? I don't know how many years running now. I'm really expecting us to lose. And that's okay. We come back, and you're gonna give me grief on Sunday, and I'm gonna love it. It's gonna be awesome, okay? It is. But how many of us, when our team loses... We lose maybe a few hours, 
maybe a day, maybe two days, maybe a week in a funk because our team lost. Guys, it doesn't matter. Home education versus public. This was a big thing in Omaha. Home education is the best. I love public schools. My family, personally, we do both. Eden right now in high school, she's taking classes at the public school here in town, but we also homeschool her as well. There's pros and cons to both of them, but we can get people so caught up in this whole idea that they begin to create quarrels and dissension in a church. How about natural versus processed in the foods we eat, right? I love bacon. Bacon's natural, right? That's the candy of the gods. Bacon's natural, okay? But we also talked about this, this spread that comes in a, in a box, a square. It's two degrees off of being plastic, all right? It's just two molecules short of being plastic. You know what? It still tastes good on a roll. Is it going to kill me? Probably, okay? But, but I'm dying happy because nobody wants to eat Jesus with tofu on their breath, okay? It's a true story. But we get discussions. We get caught up and we think, hey, I'm better than everybody else because I don't do anything with antibiotics, no growth hormones, none of that other stuff, okay? I'm all natural. That's fine. But don't get that so don't let that consume you to where you lose sight of what we're supposed to do. Cash versus credit. So we took FPU in Omaha. This was a big deal there because there were some people that came, <laughs> they were just, man, they were militant. And they said, look, you got to get rid of all your credit cards. You got to cut them all up. Credit cards are evil. All right? Well, credit cards in them themselves are not evil. They're not. Are they misused? Absolutely. Do you have to be careful? Absolutely. They say, well, no Christian should ever be in debt. And having a credit card means you're in debt. Okay? Now, my wife and I, we use cash a lot. We have cash envelope for groceries, for clothing, for toiletries, for date nights, for going out with the kids. We use cash for those things, and it works for us. And we love it. But we also use our credit card for some things. Okay? We had to reserve a car rental this week. You know car rental companies do not like debit cards? There is a bunch of hoops you got to jump through with a debit card. A bunch of hoops you got to jump through with a credit card. You don't have to go through those hoops. They'll still use the debit card, but you got to do a lot of times you got to do, the, they have to do a background check. They'll actually do a credit score run on you. There's a whole bunch of stuff they'll do when you use a debit card. Okay? So there's some value there. Now, I'm going to say this. If you go a month and you have a carryover balance on your credit card, get rid of it because that's an unpaid debt that you're carrying over. Get rid of it. You're not paying your debts at that point. But let me think about it this way. Logically speaking, this is how I thought of it. You know, the city here in town, I pay the city for my electricity, for my water, for my sewer. I don't prepay them for those things. I pay them for what I use. They give me a service and I pay it off in full at the end of the month. I don't prepay. Is that a debt? Yes, it is. Do I pay it? Yes, I do. Should Christians be in debt? The Bible says you're going to be servant to the lender. Yes, because I owe the city something. But I have to function my life with some debt. How do I? It's a bill. So how do I do it? I pay it off every single month. Credit cards, the same thing. They give you a service render. They allow you convenience. They allow you to pay things here. There's some things. As long as you pay it off, my opinion, every month, it's okay. But what happens is that sometimes we get militant about this idea and we cause fights and we cause quarrels and we look down on people because they're using a credit card or, man, they're being crazier because they think cash is, cash is king, all right? Don't get me wrong, cash is king. But then we get caught up on both sides and it causes quarrels, people. We're here to love one another. Love is the essence of our message, not who's right and wrong on things like sports teams, home education versus public, the type of food you eat, cash and credit. That's not what's important. It's the message of the gospel. Here's one. Republicans versus Democrats. Is this maybe taking the world by storm right now? How many of you guys here are Christians? All right, you're, don't raise your hand. How many of you guys here read the Babylon Bee? Because it's the same thing, okay? It's not. The Babylon Bee is a Christian satire. Thanks, Linda, because Linda reads Christian ba satire, okay? The Babylon Bee. They had a great article this week. President Trump, in a very shrewd move, came out in favor of the impeachment, knowing the Democrats opposed everything he would say, so then they dropped the impeachment, okay? <laughs> and not only that, they dropped out of the presidential race because if he doesn't want to be president, we want him to be president because everything he says is wrong. <laughs> I love that article. It laughed, all right? Guys, we get caught up in politics. It's not that they're not important. They are important, but these are not what should consume us. What should consume us is this message of love. What should consume us is the gospel. That's what we are to be. And so this December, as we get together with family, 
We're going we're gonna to have conversations like these. We are. But in that conversation, are you bringing in the fact that we have a God who came to this earth, died for us, is now in heaven preparing a place for us? Is that part of our conversation? Because it should be. That is the focus what we should be. Because all these topics distract us from our message, which is the gospel of grace. God wants us to focus on this gospel of grace. That's what's important. So we don't get caught up in silly discussions. We live for eternity. We live for eternity. Paul says this, bodily training is of some value, but godliness is of value in every way that holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. What's he say there? Very first part, he says, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. As it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, I'm going to go on a rabbit trail. I don't do that very much because I'm not a rabbit hunter. I'm lying to you. All right, we're going on a rabbit trail. When I read this verse, I was reminded of a moment as a teenager at summer camp when I, all right, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard the Bible verse, what you reap, you will also sow? You ever heard that? The whole idea? When I was a, a summer student, summer camper, this Bible camp, I reaped, well, actually, I sowed something that now I am reaping. And I sowed it during this verse. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. Pastor Cash was teaching our Bible lesson. My wife remembers this. She was there. Not as my wife at that point, because I was only 18. Anyway, Pastor Cash was saying, look, guys, when I was in college, high school, college, said I was in shape. I was working out. I went to the YMCA all the time. I played racquetball. I played tennis. I had all this stuff. He said, I was in great condition. I was. But let me tell you, that stuff fades. And he said, look at me now. I'm a physical wreck. And he was, okay? He was a, the typical Baptist preacher. Think, boy, you hit the pot like one too many times, all right? He was big. He was a tall guy, but he was huge. At that time, as a high school student, when he said, look at me now, I'm a physical wreck, me being who I was, sowed the seeds of, amen, pastor. I congratulated him on that. And he looked at me, he said, shut up, bear, you jerk. Every Sunday morning now, I reap that from you guys. Because <laughs> every Sunday morning, somebody says, well, at least we'll get a good preacher now, right? Thank you, Kyle. That's an aside. Anyway, guys, the truth is this. We know the older we get, the weaker our bodies get. I mean, that's just the reality. We are all falling apart. Some more than others, and you know who you are. <laughs> but we're all falling apart. There's some value here. We should take care of our body, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost. But godliness is the most important thing we can do. This training for godliness. This has to be what's on our minds. God, what can you teach me? Go back to that teachable thing. What can you teach me? Are you willing to learn spiritual things? Are you trying to study on spiritual things? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's the Iwana key verse. God wants us to come before him as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Are we understanding what it means to handle the word of truth? Are we willing to be trained to do this? 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8, the very first part. Focus on this very first part. The end of all things is at hand. That's what I want us to think about. The end of all things at hand. Okay, we're coming to the end. We know this. Therefore what? Be self-controlled. Sober minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, okay, catch that? In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. That's living for eternity. That's recognizing that what's happening here on earth is just short, it's temporal. The end is at hand. Therefore, I need to live for eternity. 2 Corinthians 5 says this. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We're living in a short life, guys. It's what we do for eternity that matters. Live for eternity. Remember who our hope, I'm sorry. Remember who our hope is. We have to remember who our hope is. Clean, I read that verse earlier today in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two. We're gonna read it here again in just a second. This idea of looking to Jesus. 
That's what we need to do. We need to look to Jesus. First Timothy 4, 9. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and we strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Pastor, what does that even mean? Well, look at this. Is Jesus able to be the Savior of the world? Yes. Did he die for the world? Yes. Did he come saying he's the Savior of the world? Absolutely. The angel said he would be the Savior of the world. But is the whole world saved? No. Those who believe are. Those who believe. Just because Christ offered a gift doesn't mean all who receive it. So Jesus came, and he is the Savior of the world, the living God, Savior of the world. But especially for those who believe. He's one of those, we have an intimate relationship with him through our belief. Christ is our hope. He is our hope. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is our hope. This Thanksgiving, this Christmas, guys, let's not get caught up. Let's not get caught up in the crazy stuff. Let's remember what's real, what's the most important thing for us. So what? What does this mean for us? Well, becoming a mature follower of Jesus Christ is a lifelong quest. This whole idea of being teachable, this whole idea of being willing to have this attitude of being willing to be taught, that's something that's lifelong. It never ends. We never reach a point where we arrive. We're not going to. Nobody is. Are you willing to look at that and say, God, I'm always going to be teachable? And what happened? Paul warns us about being distracted from our goal. He says, look, don't get caught up in these things. Don't lose sight. To be used by God in an amazing way, to be a mature follower of Jesus Christ is one who's going to keep his eye on the ball, so to speak. Keep track of what's happening. How we respond to this, of course, is going to make a difference in our own personal growth. And if we have a church full of people who are personally growing, we're going to have a church that's growing. Paul writes these things though so that we can know how one ought to behave in the household of God, the church of the living God. Today we're given a few more things from Paul, what it means. And maybe to a degree we're kind of stepped on a little bit to sit there and think about how easy it is to get caught up and distracted from what Paul says is the most important thing for us as a church to do. That message that we have, that message of most importance. So guys, this Thanksgiving, this December, let's not lose our focus. Let's not lose our focus on what God wants from all of us. Father, you're a good God, loving broken people. Paul wrote of, he said he was the chief of sinners. And he gave his testimony of the things in his life that he had done that were, that were wrong, that were sinful. And Father, I sit here and look at my own life and I can see that, yep, God, I'm not perfect either. All of us are able to do that. Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to see ourselves as broken as we really are, but at the same time to recognize that we have a hope in you, the Savior of the world, and with our faith in you, Lord, we have been redeemed. We have been restored. And so while humanly speaking, we're still broken, spiritually we've been healed. And God, we praise you for that. Lord, I pray that we would never forget what you've done for us and that we would take that message. Not get distracted by things going on around us, but we take that message and proclaim it. That we'd always try to find a way to bring out the grace that you have given to us and offer it to others. Lord, help us be willing and able to do this. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.